Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for our Teacher Effectiveness webinar on today's topic of science education and teacher effectiveness, implications of the next generation science standards. As was just mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Greniger, and joining me today, I have Chris Wilson and Jody Bint from BSCS. They'll be our featured presenters. Before I get into a detailed description of our presenters, I'd like to find out a little bit about who is joining us in the audience today. You'll see a poll come up on your screen, and you can select the option that best represents the role that you fill. This is wonderful. It looks like we have a great cross-section of folks with us today. The wonderful thing is that all different folks serving in different roles will really benefit from the information on the Next Generation Science Standards that we'll go through this afternoon. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have Chris Wilson with us today from BSCS. He is a senior science educator with the Science Education Curriculum Study. Chris has done a lot of research focusing on measuring effectiveness of educational interventions in science, and specifically how to develop and measure reasoning in science. Chris is doing some current work on leading experimental and quasi-experimental studies in including examining the impacts of game-based digital materials on students' science content knowledge and the impact of a year-long lesson analysis-based professional development program on teacher science content knowledge. Chris was recently awarded the JRST Award for the most significant article published in, the 2013, in 2013 by the Journal of Research in Science Teaching. And he was previously a visiting assistant professor at the Center for Curriculum Materials and Science in the College of Education at Michigan State University. We're so pleased to have Chris with us today. Also with us, we have Jody Bintz, a science educator at BSCS. Jody designs and leads a variety of leadership and teacher development programs to build leadership capacity, improve science education, and enhance the knowledge and skills of professional development providers across the country. She serves as the co-PI on an NSF-funded research study to test the influence of a specific professional development model on student achievement in the state of Washington. She serves as the project manager for the design of tools and processes to help other leaders support teachers' implementation of the NGSS. She serves as a member of the design team for video cases for Science Teaching Analysis Plus, VISTA Plus, an NSF-funded research study. She serves as a member of the Colorado Champions for STEM Education Leadership Development Program, and she was a previous high school science teacher and instructional services consultant. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chris and Jody. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on the Next Generation Science Standards and Teacher Effectiveness. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, our goal for today, or our multiple goals for today, is to encourage you uh, to think about some of the challenges associated with implementing the NGSS. Uh, to help you explore some models and evidence around effective teaching and the next generation science standards, uh, to discuss some challenges associated with measuring effective teaching and the next generation science standards, and to provide an overview of tools and resources that support effective science teaching uh, using the NGSS. I'd like to start by cautioning you that this is, uh, this is not a webinar describing in detail the structure of the NGSS. 
Uh, we're hoping that most of you come to this web webinar today already, already somewhat familiar with the NGSS. Um, we will start with a somewhat brief overview of the Next Generation Science Standards, um, but if you're looking to dig deeply into the standards themselves, then uh, we can definitely help point you towards some resources that will help you. Um, resources from Achieve, the group that have been leading the NGSS development and implementation. Uh, there are also a lot of great resources from NSTA and on their website, um, which you could look at. And I encourage you all to share resources with each other in the parking lot there, those of you who knows, know of things um, which should be good for you to look at. Um, and so just a little background on where Jody and I come at this from. Uh, we're not the developers of the NGSS or associated with the lead organizations that were. Um, rather, we're science educators and researchers at BSCS, which, as many of you know, is a nonprofit education research and development organization started over 50 years ago in response to the launch of Sputnik and the need for the U.S. to uh, catch up in science education. Um, and so inevitably, uh, we've been embracing and reacting to the NGSS in a lot of our work. Um, and across a wide range of projects, we've been exploring in detail what the implications of the NGSS are for curriculum, for professional development, uh, for assessment, and so on. Um, and that involves both research studies, and we'll talk about one of those uh, today, as well as working with district leadership teams and teachers to explore how to integrate the NGSS into science programs. Um, so that's where we're coming at this from. Um, so this webinar today is not about NGSS as it pertains to district level teacher evaluation or state specific issues, but rather we'll be examining teacher effectiveness as it pertains to student learning, what we've been learning about how to support teachers in, in, in enacting the NGSS, and how that knowledge can, be, can contribute to the field in terms of our collective understanding of effective science teaching. So we have three primary questions to consider today as we proceed. Um, the first there, how does the NGSS impact the instruction of science content? That is, what are the implications of the NGSS for how we need to teach science? Uh, how can we support teachers in effectively implementing the NGSS in their classrooms? So what support do teachers need? What kind of tools and resources are available to support teachers? And uh, how might the implementation of the NG NGSS imp impact our ability to measure teacher effectiveness? And when we think about measuring teacher effectiveness, we're doing so um, to, for that measure, for the, those results to serve as evidence of the effectiveness of instructional materials or perhaps of a professional development program or some combination thereof. In other words, we ask ourselves the research question, to what extent do the instructional materials or PD program under study improve teacher effectiveness? We know that the NGSS affects how we measure the impact of our programs, and we are wrestling with that every day. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have a quite broad question um, to get a feel for where each of you are coming from initially. Elizabeth, do you bring that up? Sure. Um, so folks, we'd like to hear from you. Um, we have an open-ended question and we'd like you to respond in the poll box on the screen with just a few comments about what does the introduction of the NGSS mean to you in your role? I see a few comments about the focus on inquiry-based practices. It's also fascinating to see how many of your comments are spanning the education system from thinking about what's going to happen for individual students to talking about what would happen uh, what, what changes might be implied in individual classrooms, as well as what does this mean for higher education, particularly uh, for teacher education. 
And it's also exciting to see references to um, uh, teaching science effectively for the 21st century and thinking about what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like. We'll have an opportunity to continue thinking about that together as we move forward in the webinar. Absolutely. There's clearly a lot to think about here. The NGSS are, are not business as usual. They're implement, impacting everything we do from assessment to curriculum to PD to teacher education. To assessment. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Elizabeth, will these um, comments be recorded? I presume they will. Absolutely. Yep. Excellent. We'll give the last few folks who are typing the chance to get their comments in, and um, we will have a record of this. And just for participants on the line, there will be an archive of this webinar available after the fact. So if you have uh, colleagues who are unable to attend today, we'll be sure to get that link out where you can direct them to get the great information you're learning about today. So it's clear, it's clear from your comments that you recognize how the winds of change, so to speak, are blowing. And it's really an exciting time for science educators, those of us who are uh, committed and passionate about uh, working with learners of all ages to uh, implement the next generation science standards. And it's obvious from your comments that you recognize that um, this enactment will definitely not be business as usual. <laughs> Great. So I think we'll move that poll right off the screen and we'll get right into the next section. Excellent. So we're going to start with a brief, as I mentioned, brief overview of the next generation science standards, just in case some of you aren't quite as up to speed as others. Um, standard science education are, of course, not new. Um, we, have, uh, we have had the AAAS benchmarks for science literacy in 1993, uh, the National Science Education Standards, the NSES, in 1996. Um, and both documents painted a picture, uh, if you will, of science education that was in sharp contrast to traditional instruction. Um, a picture of science education in which students construct their own understandings of important science concepts, um, in which students learn both the disciplinary content knowledge and how that knowledge is created. So there's both aspects there. Uh, instruction in which students engage in genuine inquiries where they don't know the outcome of the inquiry beforehand and uh, an important role for ongoing formative assessment, of course. Uh, and these documents have had a tremendous impact on science teaching and learning, um, as well as things like curriculum materials, assessment, professional development, and so on. Uh, many states based their Stein standards off the recommendations in these documents. And um, I've heard people joke that these two documents were the first two citations required in every science education research paper for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So they've been highly influential documents and in where we can uh, assume that the NGSS will, uh, will be also. So there's been various reasons why um, new standards were chosen to be developed. The there was various motivation for the new standards. Um, these previous standards are 20 years old, and there are a number of reasons why many felt new standards were needed. And these include, as this slide mentions, major advances in science. Uh, we need to be teaching contemporary science, and which includes many recent developments. Uh, things like our understanding of human evolution, of genetics, uh, cell biology, waves, particle physics, uh, our understanding of the universe, and so on, and so forth. So we need to be teaching contemporary science. There's also been major advances in our understanding of teacher, teaching and learning. So that's included how to scaffold student engagement in science practices, such as constructing explanations, argumentation, and using models. Um, and the need to more closely integrate inquiry and the practices of science with science ideas. I think um, previous um, standards attempted this, but many state standards ended up um, not uh, keeping these things more separate than uh, we would have liked. So the inquiry and the ideas of science were often not as integrated as they could be. There's also an increasing role for technology in science teaching and learning and research around things like um, learning progressions. 
Uh, that is empirical pathways for student learning that describe uh, increasingly sophisticated ways of reasoning about science, um, pathways that can help provide uh, cohesion to the K-12 curriculum. There have also been a range uh, and a number of societal challenges um, that the new standards hope to address. And one of these is global competi competitiveness and uh, concerns about how American students were doing on international tests, uh, the need for a highly trained workforce, uh, which increasingly includes science and engineering, uh, concerns about the lack of diversity in many areas of science, uh, the need to align science instruction with other standards movements, particularly the Common Core, and we can talk a little bit more about that later if you like, and the need to elevate engineering in standards documents and the importance of K-12 engineering education, and the increasing importance for the public to be scientifically literate and an increasing role of science in our everyday lives. So things like talking to doctors, making choices in line with uh, one's values, purchasing, voting, etc. I'm sure many of you are aware the next generation science standards arose from a framework document um, which presented the research base behind the structure and content of the NGSS. Uh, that went through a couple of rounds of revisions during which feedback was solicited from researchers, scientists, teachers, administrators, and so on. And there was a lot of spirited uh, discussion in the field about what we do and do not know about teaching and learning in science and uh, how to reflect that in the new standards. And I encourage you to read that document if you're interested in uh, digging deeper. We can put a link up there in the parking lot, I think. There were four lead partners associated with um, the development of the NGSS. Um, there's NSTA, AAAS, NRC, and Achieve. Uh, Achieve, who also played a major role in the development of the Common Core, and who brought that and other uh, expertise to the development process. And the developers, who were representatives from 26 lead states. Um, these were um, K-12 educators, as well as experts in science education, students with disabilities, English language learning, state-level standards, assessment, workforce development, as well as a number of other areas. So there was uh, a lot of uh, diverse range of uh, experience across the development team. And as of April 9, this is constantly evolving, and new states are uh, getting closer to adopting all the time. But as of April 9, there are currently the states in orange had adopted uh, the NGSS. So that's uh, I think California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Kansas, Illinois, Kentucky, Rhode Island, Maryland, Vermont, Delaware, DC, and New Jersey, I believe. So as Chris mentioned, the uh, NRC framework uh, identified uh, what was important for students to know and be able to do moving into the future. And in their work, the authors identified three dimensions of science learning. Dimension one is, are the science and engineering practices, and they are just that, practices used by scientists and engineers as they test ideas and design and uh, create new knowledge. The eight practices are to be used by students to help them investigate the natural world. Um, these eight practices help students to solve meaningful problems uh, related particularly to the, to the designed world. Uh, they should not only use these practices to learn, but students should also be able to use these practices to demonstrate their understanding. They, um, one important aspect of this particular dimension is the opportunity for helping students be very aware of their use of the practices to go to that meta level of uh, appreciation for these important, this important aspect of science. The second dimension are, are the cross-cutting concepts. And the cross-cutting concepts in particular are not new to our thinking about what's important for students. They've been a major component of both the AAAS benchmarks and the National Science Education. In the next generation, uh, National Science Education Standards. In the next generation science standards, the cross-cutting concepts span the disciplinary core ideas and in many ways are inherent in the practices themselves. 
There are seven cross-cutting concepts, and these ideas help direct teachers and students to look for, examine, and test connections in, across the core ideas in science and the practices in science and engineering in ways that deepen their understanding of the disciplinary core ideas and help them develop a scientifically based view of the world. And finally, the disciplinary core ideas represent the disciplines that are typically considered uh, when we think about science standards, namely the life sciences, physical sciences, and the earth and space sciences. And of course, as Chris mentioned, with the next generation science standards, engineering has been elevated. And so the fourth disciplinary core idea is engineering, technology, and applications of science. Typically, in previous uh, standards documents and, and standards as they are reflected at the state level and even at district level, these three aspects of science learning have been treated as separate entities. For the next generation science standards, we look for learning at the intersection of these three important components of science learning. And as we have wrestled in our work with thinking about uh, how the next generation science standards can be enacted and uh, help us move toward a stronger vision of science education, we want to think about how we can promote learning at this nexus, at this intersection of the three dimensions of the next generation science standards. As such, there are seven conceptual shifts that help us um, articulate the changes that one might expect when embracing and enacting the next generation science standards. Um, as uh, I think I mentioned when I was reading all of your comments from the earlier poll, the winds of change are blowing, and these conceptual shifts help us frame our thinking about some of those changes. Shift number one, K-12 science education should direct, or sorry, should reflect the interconnected nature of science as it is practiced and experienced in the, in the real world. And this particular shift helps us think about the three dimensions of the NGSS at their intersection rather than as they have been considered frequently in the past as separate entities. Shift number two highlights that the next generation science standards are performance expectations for students. And um, I, I use the abbreviation PEs when referring to performance expectations. And so these PEs are intended to inform large-scale assessments by defining what students must know and be able to do at this intersection of the three dimensions. They don't necessarily explicitly define curriculum. Uh, at a lesson level or a unit level, um, or even a program level, but rather describe expectations for students learning at the end of a grade band and certainly by the end of their K-12 science education experience. The performance expectations should not be interpreted as assessment tasks, but rather help provide a vision for what learning at the nexus of these three dimensions should look like, sound like, and feel like, uh, and how students would demonstrate their understanding. Shift three, the NGSS emphasizes coherence and focus. The standards build from grade band to grade band. You'll see disciplinary core ideas uh, that build on one another across the grade bands. And perhaps as importantly, more importantly, we'll see how the practices and cross-cutting concepts build as well. Shift four. Here the focus is on developing conceptual understanding. While facts and details can, are important, they serve as evidence of learning, they are not the focus of instruction. Rather, conceptual understanding and the application of content is critical. For shift five, the focus on engineering and technology jumps right out at us. Um, 
these areas receive strong attention in the NGSS. Engineering design is raised to the same level as scientific inquiry, and core ideas associated with engineering and technology are raised to the same level as other science disciplines. Shift six, the NGSS are intended to prepare students for their future, future education, future careers, um, and to serve as scientifically literate citizens in a, global, in a global society. And finally, as Chris mentioned earlier, the um, NGSS and Common Core state standards are aligned. They have been explicitly and carefully matched throughout the Next Generation Science Standards uh, to reflect uh, this strong desire and need for science to be a part of every learner's K-12 education. And as such, this link between the Next Generation Science Standards and Common Core Standards um, are made substantively within the documents and are intended to promote equity. So we want to give you a chance to think about which of these conceptual shifts you perceive as representing the greatest challenge for you particularly as it uh, relates to teacher effectiveness and what teachers will be um, encouraged or desire to do in their everyday uh, classroom practice. So Elizabeth, the, the poll I think is yours. Yep, the poll should be coming up onto the screen and folks can select the ones that they feel answer that question. And while folks are responding to that, I see a couple of people in the parking lot are asking about the availability of the slides for today. And you'll see down in the bottom the resources to download box. The set of slides is available there, as well as the video transcript for the video we'll be showing later on in the webinar. You can download the PowerPoint there and share it with uh, colleagues or others who might be interested in the topic. And as I already mentioned, we'll also be sending a link to our Rel Mid-Atlantic Teacher Effectiveness website. And that's a place that you'll find the archive of today's event. And you can direct other folks to that link if they would be interested in listening to the webinar. OK, so, as so we're watching the poll resort as we're watching the poll resort, uh, results come up on the screen, um, we're noticing that the, the shift that you see as representing the, great cha the greatest challenges for us are shift number two, the focus on student performance expectations, shift number four, how the NGSS focus on deeper understanding, particularly application of science content, mm -hmm. and shift five, science and engineering are integrated. And this is, this is pretty typical of what we see when we work with teachers and le other leaders across the country. Um, frequently, we also see shift number one identified and thinking about all that it means to promote teaching and learning at the intersection of the three dimensions. And how do we um, make that shift from treating these ideas as being discrete entities to wrapping our heads around what it means to learn them together. Um, we frequently hear teachers and leaders talk about the, challenges, the challenge represented by science and engineering being integrated. And um, many of our, our teachers talk about how they just don't feel prepared to teach engineering concepts, to help students learn uh, engineering design processes and uh, feel like they have a lot to do uh, from, from their own uh, growth opportunities to improve their abilities in those areas. Great, so I think we can move on from this poll and get into the next section. So in our work, we typically get three questions. Um, what do NGSS-aligned instructional materials look like? What does NGSS-aligned assessment look like? And what does NGSS-aligned 
instruction look like? And so for the next 30 minutes or so, we'll take on that third question and focus on instruction. So to give you a chance to um, consider this important question, uh, you'll see a, a, a question there on the screen. How would you describe the ideal classroom in which NGSS are being effectively implemented? We want you to think about what you would um, hope to see in that classroom, what you would hope to hear in that classroom, not only from students, but also from the teacher. Um, what we'll be doing for the next uh, few minutes or so is taking a look at a classroom video. And in that video, you'll see a teacher that will be at some uh, degree, some level of, of uh, enactment of the Next Generation Science Standards. And uh, you'll have a chance to compare your ideas to what you see in this particular video. So keep track of that question. And to provide just a bit of context, this teacher participated in a year-long professional development program that was part of a research study focused on improving science teaching and learning. And this particular teacher is in a fifth grade classroom. And she's teaching a unit uh, with the science focus on sun's effect on climate and season. So it's within the earth and space sciences realm. The practice that I think you'll see evidenced in the video that was certainly at, uh, in, in explicit in the uh, instructional materials, the lesson plans that she was using, are developing and using models. It's practice number two in the science and engineering practices. And the cross-cutting concept that is the focus here is patterns. Uh, to provide you just a bit more context, this particular lesson, the one that you'll be seeing on the video, is the fourth in a unit of six lessons, and each of those lessons was about 60 to 75 minutes in duration. Um, we'll, dip oh, in, have to look. we'll dip into uh, her classroom during lesson four, and you can see there the focus for lesson four, but I want to share with you just a bit about what happened before. Uh, the video that we'll be seeing and a little bit about what might happen after the video uh, that we'll watch. Uh, in lesson one, students uh, take a look at maps of both the United States and the world and they identify that patterns uh, in temperature vary at different times of the year in the U.S. and at different places in the world. In other words, that's the natural phenomenon that is under investigation. In lesson two, students uh, engage in an investigation where they learn that some parts of the world receive more direct sunlight than other parts of the world, and this is due to the curved surface of Earth. In lessons three and four, students explore the idea of Earth's tilt and orbit and how the Earth's tilt and orbit around the sun influence the observed patterns and temperatures at different places on Earth at different times of the year. So we'll be dipping into uh, that, this fifth grade classroom uh, during lesson four. Following um, this experience, students explore how different amounts of daylight influence patterns and temperature at different places on Earth at different times of the year. And finally, lesson six helps them draw all of these ideas together of direct and indir indirect sunlight, tilt, orbit, and spin, as well as uh, different amounts of daylight. Uh, that different places on Earth experience at different times of the year, and they draw all of that together in Lesson 6. So while you're watching this video, I will encourage you to keep these two questions in mind. And following uh, your video, the, the observation of the video, we'll actually put up a poll, and you'll have a chance to respond to these two questions um, in the text box. So to um, help make the greatest uh, use of your time watching this video, we've provided the classroom video transcript for you. And for those of you who've had a chance to download that and take a peek at that, you'll notice that there's some information at the top of the transcript. And this information includes the two focus questions that you see on the screen, because pretty soon 
those two focus questions are going to go away and you're going to see the video. So as you scan down that transcript, you'll also notice that there are some timestamps and codes for who is talking. The, the codes represent um, FN for new student, S stands for st a student that would continue talking, and T for teacher. And as I mentioned, after viewing the video, we'll provide an opportunity for you to respond to these questions in, in the chat box. So if we could go ahead and cue that video. And as uh, they're doing that from the technical end, please let us know if you're having difficulty seeing or hearing the video by commenting in the technical issues pod. And uh, what we may need to do is restart that video if lots of folks are struggling with that. So with that, you have your transcript, and it looks like the video is coming up. What is your evidence that students are learning or not at the intersection, and what is Ms. Bill Castro doing or not to, to support students' learning? It's your turn. It's winter on the opposite. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, well, the Earth has to so can I have you freeze in position one where the North Pole is pointed toward the North Star and the Sun? Okay, so when you put the Sun the sun there. What do you notice about how the sun is hitting you? Well, it's kind of like it's going like, oh, yeah, it's under, going more yeah, uh, under like, here and by the equator than like more up here and then down here, but it's um, more going on the equator. So if you say up here and down here, what are the vocabulary terms so you have for the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so Christine, are you saying that the sun is hitting more in the Northern Hemisphere or on the equator? Uh, more on the equator, but um, it's it's also a lot of bright light on the on the northern, northern hemisphere just to give enough light, but it's more hitting the equator. Okay, so you think there's more on the equator than in the northern hemisphere? What's happening in the southern hemisphere when you have? Um, there's not as much. much. It's not as much. Okay. There's not as much sunlight, so um, it's winter. Okay. What do you guys observe when the Earth is in position three? So, so this is still pointed toward the North Star, but it's pointed away from the sun. It would be right here. Okay, let's right see. Here. The sun right three is over here. Yeah. So thanks for holding us in. It'd be totally opposite. Yeah, yeah because um, when it was in position one. They was winter, but now this would be summer. So I noticed that winter. What makes you say that it's winter? Because there's less light hitting the northern hemisphere. And I, I kind of notice that wherever we move it, there's more light hitting the equator than anywhere else. Well, there's yeah. more hitting light right because there. Because like, not exactly. So like there's still less light up here, but there's more there's light hitting the equator because it's more direct. Yeah, there's more direct light. It's more like there, because that's the, like the little circle that's being like, Yeah, it's right technically there. just hitting like right there. Because when you hit it, there's like a little circle of light, like mm -hmm. the brightest yeah. circle. There's a bright light Let's circle, say. and then it's right there. So, so Mara says the brightest part is down here. Christina was saying the brightest part is up here. What do you think? When it's like right there. Well, well, put the light right here. And right in the middle. But that's technically well, yeah, still right it's here. Still hitting, yeah, it's hitting like right here. Because that's where I see like the circle. Like oh, so, bright, like, so if this is Colorado, this is Argentina, right there would be summer in Argentina, uh -huh. and then but then if there, you come over here, in Colorado, it goes up and not as much under. Yeah, so it depends on where it is in the location. Uh, if the it's right there, then it can't It depends really on where it is in the orbit. Yeah. In the orbit. Okay. Like, and you notice a pretty big difference between Colorado and Argentina, right? Yeah. yeah. So I want you to play around a little. Focus questions. 
give some thought to what you saw on the video related to evidence that students are or are not learning at the intersection of the three dimensions of the NGSS. And then specifically, what is Ms. Belcastro doing or not to support students' learning? And we would love to see your responses uh, uh, to these two questions. So Elizabeth, can you bring up the poll? Absolutely. So you'll see both of those on the screen and you can answer one and then the other. And I would encourage you to think about um, providing evidence for where you see um, examples of learning at the intersection or something that Ms. Belcastro is doing or not. Look at that transcript. See if you can identify a timestamp. One of the things that is inherent in this professional development program is helping teachers be very rigorous with their analysis of video and provide evidence and some reasoning for the claims they're making about what they're seeing in the video. So it looks like folks are talking about how students are actively engaged. They've got their hands on materials. They're manipulating a physical model to demonstrate their understanding. So it sounds like you are seeing evidence of the, the practice developing and using models. A lot of you talking about the types of questions that the uh, teacher is using, whether she's using probing questions to try and get at student thinking, as well as challenging questions to really push them deeper to, uh, to support their claims. I see Janet Werner, I'm going to pick on you. You said students certainly were using cross-cutting ideas and disciplinary core ideas as they discussed their use of the model. And I would um, encourage you to think about what were those cross-cutting concepts? What were those disciplinary core ideas that um, you were seeing evidenced in the video? Frederica, you ask a good question. You say, not sure if kids are repeating what they've heard or read or if they're actually developing those ideas on their own. It's a good question. We want to be skeptical. And you are absolutely right. Kids were having difficulty carefully manipulating the materials. In this particular professional development program, we had teachers, uh, around one teachers, who were teaching these lessons. And we looked at video from their classroom. And the round two teachers who taught after Ms. Belcastro definitely came up with their own design solutions to improve students' abilities to use the models and to learn from the models. So good insight. Gloria, you're talking about how Ms. Belcastro was adopting an inquiry stance in her approach and her use of questioning techniques. Courtney, you're talking about how she's asking them to use evidence to support their claims. And you've actually pulled a quote from the transcript. We would expect teachers in this professional program to do that sort of thing as well. So this is not a question in the poll. Um, I hope that's OK, Elizabeth. But um, in that uh, response space for question five, what is Ms. Belcastro doing or not to support students' learning, where do you think teachers and students in this three-minute snippet of a classroom would fall on a continuum of teaching and learning at the intersection of these three dimensions? Do you think they are low in that 
practice? Do you think they're somewhere in the middle? Do you think um, this classroom would represent a high level of teaching and learning at the nexus? And I think it would be okay for folks to respond in the parking lot to respond to that question. Oh, thanks, Elizabeth. No problem. And maybe while they're responding, there was a nice comment or question. Let me go back and find it um, to question number five. What is Ms. Belcaster doing or not doing? Eric, ah, there's too many coming in. I'm not getting to it. Eric was asking about this is a great video that shows the teacher working with a small group of students, but how do we facilitate this type of learning on a larger scale in a class of 30, potentially 30 plus, that many classrooms have? Um, do you have any insight into that? Uh, we not only have insights, but we have classroom video of that. It's just not classroom video we're going to see today. And I see um, uh, Peter also says something about, I would really like to see more groups sharing and uh, more groups coming to consensus about their learning. And um, I actually have, I think, five clips from this particular lesson, uh, uh, three total clips of Ms. Del Castro working with small groups of students. And in each of those clips, she's taking those small groups of students from where they are in their current understanding or what perhaps naive uh, or uh, naive conceptions they have about this particular phenomenon. And she helps them move forward by encouraging them to use the model, by encouraging them to cite evidence, and by encouraging participation from every member of the group. The last two clips from this particular lesson that um, I have clipped up actually show her sitting with the whole class. She's in a comfy chair and the kids are um, around her and she has one model in the middle of the room that she has different students come up and use to um, represent their understanding. And because she has also worked with students on uh, one of the uh, strategies that are a part of this professional development program called Communicating in Scientific Ways. She encourages students to use those sentence stems, to use those ways of communicating to help them um, build on one another's ideas, to help them agree or disagree respectfully with one another's ideas, and to ask one another for evidence. Um, so, I guess what I'm saying is that it is possible. It is not easy, as we all know. I, I don't think anybody would say this is easy. And I will say that um, we have two clips of Ms. Belcastro where she is dealing with some classroom management issues. Uh, she doesn't have, I mean, her classroom management behavioral issues are, are um, classroom management strong behavioral uh, issues are, are limited. but. With any fifth grade uh, class, you're going to have some challenges. And um, when she is dealing with those management issues, we have evidence from video that she's missing opportunities to probe or challenge student thinking about particular ideas or to highlight some important ideas that are shared by students that are actually right on target in terms of the learning goal. So yeah, this is definitely a challenging. Uh, this is definitely a challenging issue. How do we work with small groups of students spread throughout the room, manipulating materials, and then how do we help them negotiate uh, consensus around uh, consensus around important science ideas and using evidence from their experiences. Jody, thank you so much for expanding on that, responding to that question. I think a few folks are asking if they can have access to these videos that you reference, and I'm not 100% positive on that answer if you're able to release those um, videos for others to view. Um, we would have to, that would have to go through our permissions process, and so um, what they could do is, yeah, if certainly get in touch with us. I think our uh, email addresses will be on at the end. We can um, negotiate and figure those things out on a case-by-case -case basis. And if it's not this video, we have an awful lot of video from a range of projects where we do have appropriate permissions. 
and um, we'll be very happy to work with you to try and uh, put those to the best possible use. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Chris and Jody. So I see we have quite a few comments over in the parking lot in response to the last informal question. Um, do you want to touch on any of that, Chris or Jody? Um, I haven't been tracking that parking lot. Could, could you perhaps summarize what you're seeing there? Because I think my question for that informal parking lot is where do you think this classroom falls on a continuum? Do you think it represents low, medium, high level of learning at the nexus of the dimensions? And in scanning myself, people actually are all over the spectrum, right. um, <laughs> starting kind of from the, the initial comments. People are saying on the low end, you know, mostly that the teacher addressed core ideas, some cross-cutting but not too much, no problem solving or practices. And then we move into some who believe that it was at the high level um, because students can have the discourse on their own. And just building on those ideas, um, in the professional development setting, we would negotiate a shared understanding of this particular video with um, folks making claims based on their observations of the classroom using the transcript, turning those claims at, at, and, and then supporting those claims with evidence from the transcript and negotiating alternative ideas. So uh, I don't think it's surprising that folks have a, a range of responses to this question. I think it perhaps may reveal the amount of work that we have to do related to uh, consensus building for what this kind of teaching and look, learning looks like. Well, this surely initiated a lot of great conversation and I think folks would agree that this is a valuable professional development tool um, and, you know, one that really gets the conversation going around the instruction that's happening. Absolutely, and I think uh, it was Gerard there who mentioned uh, the value of, of video and professional development and I think our next slides kind of explain a little how we use uh, video like that within a professional development context. So okay, really so I... Yes, please. Oh, go ahead, Jody. I was just going to say we'll move off the polls, and I know people still have a lot of great ideas to share, and we'll still have many opportunities for that through the last hour of the webinar. Excellent. So as many of you were talking about there in the parking lot as well as in the uh, poll response space, we know how important it is to support uh, enactment, effective implementation of the next generation science standards. And it, it, it's the responsibility of the entire system to think about how to make that work. So we'll share with you an example of a professional development program that has been implemented in California initially and now it has been scaled up in Colorado for fourth through sixth grade teachers. And this year-long program was the one that um, Ms. Bel Castro participated in. Um, she was actually a part of my study group that I worked with. And um, so just want to share with you some of the critical attributes of this particular professional development program. Uh, the title is Science Teachers Learning from Lesson Analysis. This is an NSF-funded line of research, and we lovingly call this program STELLA. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a, a one-year program. We, we wanted to take on that challenge of seeing if we could get powerful impacts on student learning, teacher learning, about content and other aspects of science as well as impact teacher practice in a one-year program uh, focused on the work of fourth through sixth grade teachers. So uh, the STELLA program involves a nine-day summer institute and uh, we place a heavy emphasis on lesson analysis. Not, uh, it, it's somewhat similar to what you did. I would say um, probably a bit more focused and certainly with the expectation of uh, providing evidence and um, 
uh, for, for the claims that are being made. And then finally, we follow up with monthly study group meetings that occur during the academic year, and we have uh, nine of those in our current program. And the lesson analysis focus is, comes around two lenses, the student thinking lens and the science content storyline lens. These two lenses um, include what we would call high leverage uh, teaching strategies, learning strategies, that would promote growth in student learning, teacher learning, and teacher practice. And these two particular lenses uh, emerge from uh, some key research, namely the TIMS video study and also the findings from how people learn and how students learn science in, in the classroom. So um, we uh, this program includes multiple professional development strategies, workshop, um, study group, implementa uh, implementation of particular lesson plans, as well as the use of video to improve practice based on feedback and revision. And these two lenses, as I mentioned, are further enhanced by uh, a number of strategies that we call high leverage strategies that help uh, teachers make the, this work come alive in their classroom. So a few minutes ago, you watched an analyzed classroom video, and we skimmed the surface of what teachers in the Stella program would experience. During the program, teachers learned about each of these strategies and analyzed video for the presence of these strategies or not, and the potential impact of these strategies on student thinking and ultimately student learning. So um, in addition to these uh, strategies um, and a focus on these strategies, the program itself includes a number of activities. And you can see those activities coming up on your screen. We've talked about video analysis. We've referred to classroom implementation of lessons designed based on these two lenses. So these are lessons designed explicitly based on the use of these strategies. The analysis not only of video, but also of student work from participants' classroom implementation. So the teachers are looking at their own video, and they are looking at the video of their colleagues who are sitting right beside them. And Amy would be the first to tell you that that was really nerve-wracking, that it was difficult to watch oneself on the video and, and then uh, really be rigorous in the analysis of what's happening in terms of use of the strategies and uh, it, their impact on student learning or student thinking. Um, there's an aspect of the program that includes collaborative lesson design. And finally, um, the classroom implementation of this new unit of lessons. And you'll notice that arrow to the left, content deepening. Um, one of the things that uh, we know is that elementary teachers in particular, but all of us, in fact, can benefit from deepening our content knowledge. And throughout this program, content deepening, focused on the uh, particular science content practices of these particular lessons was emphasized. And uh, teachers had an opportunity to have uh, explicit experiences within these areas, as well as um, exploring our understanding of science content and the use of these practices through our video analysis. So those were the activities that folks uh, engaged in during the STELLA program. Components of the STELLA Professional Development Program include video analysis tasks and tools. In other words, we have video of uh, classroom teachers from in a variety of settings. And then we provide teachers with uh, practice using tools to help them think deeply and rigorously about what's going on in the classroom. You know, initially, sometimes uh, we tend to focus on behavior issues or we focus on those book bags are, that are underneath the desks or in the aisle. And what we try and do with these video analysis tasks is, help, is to help teachers focus on the specific strategies, the student thinking that's revealed, the science content storyline that is intended in the lessons, 
but is also being developed by the students. Teachers engage in analysis of practice cycles and tools, and it goes back to, I think I've used these phrases a few times, where uh, teachers make observations of the video, um, observations from the transcript, or perhaps observations from the student work, and they turn those observations into claims that they then support by evidence and reasoning from the research or literature, evidence from the transcript itself, and then we always want to promote the thinking around alternatives. What might be some other claims we could make? What might be some other reasoning that we could apply to um, our study of the particular artifact under investigation? The stellar components include lesson plans and uh, tools that help them analyze those lesson plans and enact those lesson plans in a way that makes sense for them and their kids. And finally, um, the, the stellar components include student assessments that are used by the teachers to inform their uh, practice, that are used by the students as formative assessments to help them continue to monitor their progress. But also, of course, because this is a research study, we also have um, student assessments that help us to determine, uh, to answer our research question, can this one-year professional development program really influence student learning over the course of these uh, institutes and study group sessions? Excellent. So, um, so Joseph just described the, how Stellar is this one-year professional development program. Um, this PD program that's designed to impact science teachers' content knowledge, the pedagogical content knowledge, which of course is that special um, amalgam of teachers' understanding of the science content and their understanding of how to teach that content and about student learning of that content. Um, and in turn, those two things come together to influence their teaching practice, which in turn impacts um, student science content knowledge. And so, in addition to it being a professional development program, Stella is also this large research project where we're looking at the impact of the PD on each of these outcomes. So we have outcome measures for teacher science content knowledge, their pedagogical content knowledge, which as Jody describes, we see in those early, um, uh, early data, teachers describing very quite superficial classroom management uh, uh, issues, and then later on in the program, they're describing quite complex pedagogical moves that the teachers are making. Um, and then we have measures of classroom practice. We're videoing all the teachers within the research study. And of course, we have measures of student science content knowledge. And we're particularly interested there about the types of student thinking, um, the higher order cognitive thinking, the types of student thinking was representative of that nexus at the, uh, at the center of the disciplinary core ideas, practices, and cross-cutting concepts. Um, so this is a scale-up research study and a scale-up in the sense that we're looking at a lot of teachers. We're looking at a large geographic range where we have teachers from all across Colorado taking part. Um, it's a scale-up study in the sense that it's a cluster randomized trial and that we're randomly assigning schools to treatments, which provides the highest level of uh, causal evidence that the, that the treatment was uh, responsible for any effects. And it's a scale-up study in the sense um, that we are also, the people who are delivering the professional development are not the developers. And so in essence, we're testing a model of how do we take something that's been shown to be effective at a small scale where the developers deliver the professional development and turn that into something um, where the PD providers are not those people. And those are people who have been taught how to provide this sort of, this sort of professional development. And um, associated with that, we also, we also have some interesting research questions around what does it mean to be a PD provider and what, uh, what training do PD providers need uh, and so forth. So this research study has had two cohorts, uh, one in 2011-2012 and one in 2012-2013. Uh, there were 80 schools involved in total, and those were randomly assigned to one of two treatments, this, this stellar treatment or this uh, comparison group. And overall, I think we have about 4,500 students within uh, this research study. The two treatments that we're looking at are the Stellar Professional Development Program, as Jody has described, which involves analysis of uh, videos, um, and, um, and then connected with that is all this content deepening work. So those two things combined 
Um, and we're comparing that to a content deepening program. So we didn't want to compare to no PD in the comparison group. That would be a, a straw man that we know would have no impact on teacher learning or effectiveness. Um, so we compared to a program of con content deepening um, work with university science faculty. Um, that's a type of PD that many claim is what elementary science teachers need. And so we felt that was a good comparison to uh, isolate uh, the key features of the stellar lesson analysis program. And again, both treatment groups um, in, had the same contact hours, 88.5 hours. They both had two weeks in the Summer Institute. They both had these monthly meetings throughout the year. And just to clarify, that two-week Summer Institute involved lesson analysis during half day and content deepening during a half day. So teachers were giving up two weeks of their summers to participate in this program so that across the entire year, uh, the total uh, for lesson analysis professional development uh, and content deepening professional development totaled 88 and a half hours. There's a question there about is this K-6 only? The teachers um, in this program were fourth and fifth grade teachers primarily. There were a few sixth grade teachers in there. Um, we've been working largely at that age group at the moment. We do have some, um, some projects that are going to try and look at that at the high school level also. And at the middle school as well. So right now the results that we'll share will come from our study of upper elementary. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is a line of research that we're engaged in, and um, we certainly hope to be able to expand our thinking about the potential impact of this at other grade levels, other grade bands. There's a good question there about what did the content deepening in Stella look like. And, uh, and that represented the whole range of content deepening one would expect from business as usual, um, professional development from college science faculty. So in some cases, that was quite traditional, and that was traditional content deepening in both the stellar group and the comparison group. Some of those science faculty were more comfortable with some more inquiry type approaches to content deepening, and so some of it looked like that. So it was a whole range of what one might expect science faculty to, uh, to deliver. And if I can build on that, in the study groups, uh, particularly during the academic year, our content deepening opportunities would frequently emerge from lesson analysis. And there would be times when we would just have a brief conversation uh, going back to a content document or going back to a misconceptions chart that we had. Or we would literally stop what we were doing and we would move into some sort of a common experience that made the teachers thinking visible that allowed them opportunities to wrestle with the ideas that were on the table through the use of science practices, frequently models, sometimes data. Uh, particularly constructing explanations, and they were absolutely engaged in argumentation um, in the best possible sense uh, during that time. Absolutely. And so um, we're currently finishing up our analyses at the moment. We've been uh, first prioritizing the student effects, um, and we're getting some very exciting results. For example, with that student achievement, um, we're finding that students who had teachers in the stellar PD program are significantly outperforming those who had teachers who received content deepening professional development. Uh, that is, they're performing much better on tests of science content knowledge. And this has um, been something the field has been calling for for a long time, and that it's one thing to show that different types of PD have different impacts on, on teachers. It's quite another to be able to show that the students of those teachers then learn science in different ways. And we're very excited to be able to be, uh, start demonstrating that in this, um, in this program. There's a couple of citations there for some conference presentations we've recently done. As I say, these are kind of hot off the press data, and we'll be publishing these as soon as possible. Um, you see an effect size at the top there of 0 0.68. Um, just to help you unpack that, that's a figure a lot of folks like to um, kind of uh, interpret in this type of research. Um, some researchers, um, Hill et al. have found that um, uh, in randomized control trials at the elementary level, the average effect size is about 0.33, so we're coming in at about twice the average effect of an elementary intervention. Um, we can also look um, and see, compared to sort of the average growth across the school year in the absence of an intervention, um, and we find that the average pre-post year effect size for, for, for science in grades four to five is about 0.4. And so we're coming in at about one and a half years worth of science there in the effects of this, uh, of this treatment. 
And we're currently digging in much deeper into the test itself and looking at what types of items the stellar students are outperforming the comparison group students are. And we're finding that the items that the stellar students had a greater than 50% chance of getting correct and the comparison group had a less than 50% chance of getting correct. These were items that required the students to reason with scientific models, the items that required them to use cross-cutting concepts, uh, restrain their reasoning around fundamental scientific principles and using those cross-cutting concepts, and apply their understanding using new representations and models. So that is science reasoning that's consistent with what is called for in the NGSS and three-dimensional science learning. So we're going to be digging much more into that um, at the moment, but we're, we're very excited that while the groups may do similarly on items of, say, factual knowledge, where we're really seeing the difference of stellar impact students and their ability to really reason at these higher cognitive le levels and reason in ways which are consistent um, with what's being called for in the next generation science standards. So I think we'd like to pause briefly here and have you think about some of those activities which you saw um, in the Stellar program. Those are things like looking at student work and analyzing student assessments, the, uh, the lesson analysis tasks, um, teachers looking at lessons plans and using tools to analyze lesson plans. We can pull that slide back up, I think. But we'd like to open this up to you to think about what are those activities would be most helpful to you and your school. So, Chris, if you're referring back to slide 35, would you like us to move back to that slide so folks can take a look at that? That would be lovely. Or actually, sorry, slide 34. We will go back there, and then we'll adjust where the poll box is placed. Apologize. And while you're making that move, I'll just address a couple of questions that are in the parking lot. Um, yes, this was a professional development program that was funded through the National Science Foundation, and we are ever so grateful for their support. Um, actually, this is a line of research that has been funded through NSF. Absolutely, and in, in some related work, we're now looking at what does it mean to uh, implement this type of professional development across a very large high-needs district in California. And we're also applying these, uh, this approach to professional development to pre-service teacher education. So we have a large project in New Mexico and Texas um, where pre-service teachers are using a lot of these activities during their methods courses and then receiving professional development during their student teaching and first year teaching. And we're looking at the impacts of that on um, various, uh, the same sort of outcomes as we're looking at here. So, Mahela, you're commenting that lesson analysis might be valuable. Um, could we hear more about why you think lesson analysis might be valuable? What does, what do you think, what impact do you think that might have for students or teachers or both? We're working on moving the poll back into the screen, so you should see it momentarily. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Mahela. I see you typing. So one of the questions we see coming up in the parking lot is a question about developing new professional development leaders for this pro program. And um, we're cur currently engaged in uh, a scale-up study that includes middle school teachers. And in that particular study, we are developing the module the, uh, for the leadership program. Um, I, I, we've had our first meetings on that just last week. And um, let's just put it this way. I got a lot of work to do between now and, <laughs> and December when we roll that out, because that's the focus of, of what we're doing next. And our whole team is engaged in doing that kind of work. And uh, Kathy Roth, who is uh, uh, the principal investigator for this particular line, most of the studies in this particular line of research, is um, uh, heavily involved in uh, thinking about what does it take to develop leaders for this program. 
I like that some of you have mentioned there in the uh, in the in the box there that you see the the combination of the content deepening and the lesson analysis as being important. And uh, we're definitely starting to see that in the data. We've been looking recently at the teacher outcome measures, and if we look even at the teacher content test, we find teachers doing uh, better on a on a on a test of their science content knowledge if they have this combination of stellar PD and lesson analysis and content deepening than they did if they had twice as much content deepening professional development, if their professional development was just that content deepening piece. So it's really bringing those two pieces together that's having the, uh, the impact we're seeing on the teachers. I'm also seeing comments about um, the, the, the idea of collaborative lesson development. And um, the video that you saw of Ms. Belcastro was her mid-video, and that was taken uh, during her implementation of the lessons that had been designed and provided to the participants. Um, the last video was taken of the participants' uh, lessons that they modified to uh, incorporate the particular Stella strategies, the science content storyline lens strategies and student thinking lens strategies. And, um, we take video of that particular uh, enactment then toward the end of the research study. A number of you are asking about resources and where you can learn more about the lenses and so forth. And again, our contact info will be there at the end. And uh, we'd love to hear from you so we can share as much as we can. So a couple of questions. Where can I find video resources to use with science teacher candidates? One of the variations on this theme that was the brainchild of Kathy Roth, who's the principal investigator, um, where we've been, um, uh, and, and we've, we've scaled up here at BSCS, is the, the video cases for uh, pre-service teachers and um, developing essentially what constitutes a methods course, a one-year follow-up for teachers during their student teaching year, and then a, a, a third year of work with them during their first year of teaching. And those resources are available uh, to use with science teacher candidates. Okay, we still have quite a bit of content to cover, and I want to make sure that we get to some of our other upcoming questions. I'm so pleased to see all of the engagement in the parking lot and with response to the questions. Um, looks like folks are very engaged in the topic, so we'll keep moving right along. But that can move us back to where we got to here. So, um, Obviously, in a research project like that, we've talked a little about how we were charged with trying to measure these um, outcomes, be those teacher or student outcomes. So we wanted to talk a little about some of the challenges associated with measuring three-dimensional science learning um, that the NGSS are going to present us with. So I think we can um, think of assessments as falling into two primary categories. There are, there are obviously others. but. Um, we can think of um, classroom assessments that are designed to support instruction, um, which are in essence are embedded or formative assessments uh, designed to provide teachers with information about student thinking they can respond to during instruction. And of course, student thinking as well. Absolutely. Um, and we can think of assessments that are designed to monitor science learning at a broader scale. So these are assessments that answer quite large questions, either during research or during policy discussions about how much students learned over the course of a year, how does achievement in one school compare to another, um, is one instructional technique or curriculum program more effective than another, uh, what's the effect of this policy on student achievement, and so on and so forth. Uh, but in, a, uh, in an NGSS paradigm, both of these types of assessments uh, need to attend to the crux of the NSA, NGSS, which of course, as we've mentioned, is this um, the nexus of the three dimensions. And so we're met with this challenge of how do we really measure learning at the nexus of the three NGSS dimensions? And just to kind of uh, highlight the challenge there, 
On this side, you'll see two sets of standards. The top orange box are two benchmarks from um, the AAAS benchmarks from 1993, um, and they're related to natural selection and evolution. And I'll give you a moment just to look at that top orange box initially. Note that the STEM for both of these uh, benchmarks begins with students should know that. And the ideas in these standards are quite straightforward. They, I, I think one could envision multiple choice items for these types of standards. Uh, multiple choice items that might begin with which of the following does natural selection lead to? And then four different answer choices. But then if you turn your attention to the bottom box there, the blue-ish box, um, these are three performance expectations from the NGSS on the same topics as the uh, benchmarks above and the same grade level as the benchmarks above. But note the differences here. They're quite significant. Uh, the common STEM is about demonstrating understanding, not knowing, um, which is actually language that supports assessment because uh, it gives us ideas about what we might ask students to do to demonstrate their understanding. And each performance expectation there combines practices, cross-cutting concepts, and core ideas. And we have statements about communicating information, about constructing explanations, um, about developing models. And these are sophisticated competences. And so they're going to require um, equally sophisticated measures. It's doubtful that we will see as many multiple choice items in the future as we perhaps have seen in the past. Not that necessarily multiple choices are bad, no, multiple choice items are bad. I have a fondness for them myself. But, um, so the challenge is how do we develop assessments that measure this kind of three-dimensional science learning? And one approach to that, um, to developing such methods, is called evidence-centered design. Uh, it arose from Robert Mislevy's work at ETS, and um, it's described very nicely in the NRC report on developing assessments for the NGSS, which we can link you to. Um, and it's a process I think many of you will find useful as you begin thinking about assessment in the next generation science standards. I know that was something many of you mentioned when you registered. Um, it's, and it's a process uh, that highlights the importance of clearly defining what it is you're measuring before developing the measures themselves. And so the process begins with that first step of um, defining a claim space. And I wouldn't worry about terminology there. Uh, the important part, part is that we begin by defining what claims we want to be able to make about student learning, and that being what we want students to know and what we want them to be able to do, and how we want them to know what they know. And so it's not just about factual knowledge, but knowledge at more sophisticated cognitive levels. And we need to be very precise in our language there when we're describing what we want students to know. So we don't want to use verbs like understand. We want to use um, quite specific verbs like construct, um, analyze, describe, predict, and so forth. So we need very clear descriptions of what we want students to be able to know in order we to be able to develop effective measures. And once you've defined what you want students to be able to know and be able to do, one can start thinking about tasks that allow students to, to demonstrate and to show what they know uh, with respect to those claims. Uh, the NGSS are going to require us to think about assessment tasks that take many forms. Uh, these will be anything from traditional tests to written work to lab notebooks to performance tasks and lab activities, even to classroom discussion and so on. So depending on what we're talking about and what the reasons for classrooms assessments are, um, there are many different forms those types of assessments can take. And then a third major component uh, relates to evidence and how one interprets that evidence. So we'll need to think very carefully about what we'll accept as evidence that a student has the desired knowledge and how you will analyze and interpret that evidence. And so just to quickly kind of try and unpack that for you and see, um, see how that process plays out and give you an idea how to, you might use this approach to develop NGSS-aligned assessments yourself. So with respect to that claim space, um, the NGSS actually provides us with performance expectations which do a lot of the work of that component for us. Here's one of the performance expectations that we just saw earlier. Construct an explanation based on evidence for how natural selection leads to, the adapt to adaptation of populations. We see it's very specific. It provides us with a clear statement about what we want students to know and be able to do. And then we can use to think about possible assessment tasks. And so the performance expectations in the NGSS uh, can form the basis for assessment development. 
Uh, and I should emphasize it's also important to go to the foundation boxes in the NGSS to look at the DCIs, the cross-cutting concepts and practices. The performance expectation by itself is, uh, is not really sufficient. And so in terms of the evidence component, we need to think about, if we're asking students to construct an explanation, uh, we need to think about what we want to see in such an explanation. What are characteristics of a good explanation around this science uh, idea? And there are research-based frameworks we can draw on about claims, evidence, and reasoning, as there are comparable frameworks around some of the other practices. Um, we need to think about what are the science components of a good explanation around this concept. And of course, we need to think about how we interpret our assigned scores to explanations of varying quality. And we need to do that in such a way that allows us to make decisions, whether that be a teacher making decisions about subsequent instructional, instructional moves or, say, a researcher trying to make decisions about which program or professional development is more effective. And then finally, with, this, with the tasks themselves, as I said, we could talk about classroom assessments and broader assessments. There are many considerations related to the assessment tasks that students engage in. If we're talking about classroom assessments for largely formative purposes, uh, we want the assessments to be authentic and, embe and embedded in classroom experiences. And that will often be the case for instruction that's aligned um, with the next generation science standards. As teachers are teaching in a way um, that's focusing on the nexus for the three dimensions, then there will inevitably be opportunities for them to gather formative assessment data from that instruction. So these assessments could be things like performance tasks in a lab investigation. They could be a lab write-up, um, online interactives where students manipulate variables and make predictions, record data, and so on, multi-part written items. So there are many forms these types of tasks can, uh, can take, and they can all be embedded quite authentically within the learning experiences that the students are experiencing. But of course, I think teachers are going to need um, a lot of help in um, first in designing that type of instruction and enacting that type of instruction, and then making sense of the evidence it provides about student learning. So there's an important role for professional development when it comes to formative assessment and the next generation science standards. And, uh, and finally, if we're talking about broad scale assessments, we of course need the assessments to be similarly authentic um, and focus on three dimensional science learning, but they should also uh, be designed so they can be given to a large number of students, and this may present some constraints about the types of assessments that can be used um, for broad-scale measures. They must be sufficiently standardized, depending on the purpose, so one can make comparisons. Uh, they need to be su sufficiently broad with respect to the next generation science standards and not focus in one small area of the NGSS, but the learning that, say, might occur across the course of a year. They must be feasible um, and cost-effective. Finally, they must be sensitive to, uh, to instruction. And that's a major concern about assessment in general right now, um, is the extent to which scores on tests can be generally attributed to instruction. Uh, it's one thing for a test to come for a, it's one thing to develop a test of certain science content that can differentiate between kids of different ability levels, but uh, it's quite another for that test to be able to differentiate between different types of curriculum materials, say. And we need to be very careful, especially broad scale, broad scale assessments, that if people are going to be making decisions based on, based on assessment data on what is and is not effective, be that curriculum materials, district policies, or teaching, um, and then we must use assessments that have been demonstrated and validated for that purpose. And this is especially difficult when we're talking about something as cognitively demanding as three-dimensional science learning. Because it's quite easy to say that a teacher did or did not teach students a, per a particular fact. It's very difficult to say how effective a teacher was at helping students, say, construct an explanation based on evidence around certain science ideas. And so it'll be a major challenge moving forward is how we develop instruments that are sensitive to instruction um, and Jim Popham, I think, in November in this webinar series, is going to speak more to that issue. So I, if you're interested in assessment and challenges, I uh, encourage you to uh, attend that webinar. And, uh, and we applied this process during Stella. We used evidence center design to develop the assessments within that program. And we did lots of initial work around that claim space, thinking about what we want students to know, what claims we want to be able to make about professional development. Uh, thinking about how we expected student learning from the Stellar PD to differ from that, from the content uh, deepening professional development. 
And then from there, we moved to thinking about tasks to measure that learning. Uh, we were obviously constrained by the scale of the project and having thousands of students, so the types of items we could use for different types of, uh, of assessments was interesting. And then we moved to examining the evidence piece, working on scoring, scaling, interpreting, and so forth. So we have a question here, and I'd be interested in uh, what uh, you have to think about what challenges do the, does three-dimensional learning present to understanding teacher effectiveness, uh, particularly from a measurement uh, perspective? So Elizabeth, do you want to bring that up? Yes, here it comes. So we'd like folks to think about that question. What challenges does three-dimensional learning present to understanding teacher effectiveness? While we do that, um, one of the questions that's coming up on the side is related to um, two, two different aspects, but how can NGSS Align instruction support the needs of students with disabilities and English language learners? Do you have, uh, Jody or Chris, any insight into that question? So one of the things that um, is powerful about the NGSS is the uh, alignment to the Common Core, and one of the things that is uh, a part of the, the publication of NGSS are, I, are specific links between how engagement with the Common Core can help promote equity across uh, diverse, or uh, promote equity across student groups with diverse learning needs. And so I think one aspect that contributes is, are those connections to the Common Core. I think as well in our own work and, and use of, of powerful strategies for teaching and learning, we have found that the suite of strategies that we use provide opportunities for students with different strengths. What, what is that phrase, being handy capable? Students with different strengths are able to um, use a broad variety of approaches to teaching and learning to help them uh, communicate what it is they know and understand. Um, I know that Oki Lee has written a new chapter in the Journal for Science Teacher Education, and I think that might be a place where you could go for some additional guidance about supporting um, all students and their learning of these important aspects of science education. I'd also encourage you to look at Appendix D in the uh, Next Generation Science Standards. Volume uh, 2. Volume 2. It's a major theme um, across the NGSS. It's all standards, all students. And there were major, many um, experts in um, and kind of non-dominant student groups represented during the development of the NGSS. And so that Appendix D describes a lot of effective classroom strategies to implement the NGSS with economically disadvantaged students, with students um, from different ethnic groups, students with disabilities, um, approaches for, for girls and boys, students in alternative education programs, gifted and talented students, and so forth. And so there's a lot of uh, great information within our Appendix D, uh, Volume 2 of the NGSS, which will be a great resource. I'm also seeing some comments in the response box that talk about the need for scaffolding uh, and that probably I'm going to make a leap here and uh, say that that scaffolding is uh, essential for teacher learning as well as for student learning to help um, all of us better understand what this looks like, sounds like, and feels like in, in, uh, in practice. Eric, you raise a terrific point there about uh, performance-based assessments. Um, I think in uh, certain states in the past, we've, uh, the, the uh, performance assessments have been used. They've often been um, uh, stopped when budgets got tight, and they were often quite expensive, and there are often issues around creating reliable measures, measures that can be um, developed consistent scores, measures that can be sufficiently standardized. 
So there are certainly going to be some challenges as we move away from um, quite simple assessments, as Peter mentions there, um, multiple choice items to these much more sophisticated measures of student learning. It's, uh, there's going to be a lot of work involved in um, thinking about measuring these, this type of learning as we move forward. And um, there are various groups um, who are going to provide guidelines there. I know um, on the NGSS website there'll be some um, types of items appearing fairly soon that will that'll appear and serve as models for you. Um, and the various different groups with various research projects trying to tackle what does it really mean to develop assessments that uh, really focus in on the nexus. So I think we'll move ahead now. We have uh, another short section on some tools that I know folks will find to be valuable. And we still have another question or two for the audience. So um, in our last 20 minutes or so here, we will try to continue sharing some of this great information. And so I will hand it back over to you, Chris and Joe. So as we just saw in your responses to that last question, we have significant challenges, not only as, uh, as leaders in science education and, and thinking about our own work, but also supporting teachers in making the next generation science standards come alive in their classrooms. So the question is, how do we help teachers translate the NGSS into practice? And um, a, a, a a group led by the American Museum of Natural History um, that includes representatives from BSCS and from the K-12 Alliance at WestEd took on this significant challenge. And I think I even see one or two of our advisory board members uh, popping up on the comments on the parking lot occasionally. So um, some of the folks who are helping us with this work are participating in the webinar today. Um, but our, one of the major challenges that we had is, is literally how do we help teachers make sense of what I personally refer to as a standards page. Um, in, in the case of what you're seeing on the screen, this is a standard related to Life Science Core Idea Number 2, Ecosystems, Interactions, Energy, and Dynamics at the middle school level. It includes five performance expectations, which are there at the top of the page in the white box. And then you'll see the, the three boxes that are blue, orange, and green at the bottom of the page. Those are referred to as the foundation boxes and include a list of the science and engineering practices, disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts that come together to promote understanding of these performance expectations and increase abilities of the students to actually demonstrate their understanding of these particular um, performance expectations. You'll also notice that in the green box, you can see just a little uh, additional text there related to connections to engineering technology and applications of science. Um, on other standards pages, or what I call standards pages, um, you would see connections to nature of science there as well. And so, um, as you flip through volume one of the Next Generation Science Standards, um, I, in talking with teachers, it can be overwhelming to think about how do I make sense of all of the information that's on the page, and moreover, how do I help students make sense of all of these really important aspects of science learning. So as I mentioned, um, under the, uh, the guidance of the American Museum of Natural History and with funding from the Carnegie Foundation, uh, representatives from BSCS, WestEd, and AMNH took on this challenge, and we developed um, five tools and processes that help teachers translate the NGSS into their classroom practice. And um, these five tools and processes have been piloted with approximately 80 teachers in New York and are currently um, being uh, field tested and will continue to be field tested over the course of the year. They'll be released, um, I hope, by uh, the beginning or middle of next summer. And they'll be released uh, broadly and um, available, uh, for, available for use. And uh, the intention is for, those to, for these to be available free of charge. 
So as you can see on the screen, there are five tools and processes, and I'll talk about them just briefly in order from tool one, two, and then I'm going to skip and go to tool four before I come back and talk a little bit about tool three and then tool five. So tool one um, helps teachers use the Next Generation Science Standards to plan a unit of instruction. And that unit of instruction uh, might be a four to six weeks duration, or it might uh, be up to a quarter of a particular academic year. And through that process, uh, teachers deepen their understanding of the Next Generation Science Standards by uh, literally manipulating the ideas that are present on what I referred to earlier as the standards page. Tool two uh, takes to heart this idea of backward design where we use the performance expectations to think about planning for classroom assessments. Um, we, wanna, we know that the performance expectations are intended to inform large scale assessment measures. And we also know that we want students to have opportunities to wrestle with what it means to um, demonstrate their understanding of important ideas and cross-cutting concepts through the use of a particular science practice. And so tool two helps teachers use performance expectations uh, and, and frequently bundles of performance expectations to plan for assessment. And through tool two, teachers actually uh, develop what we call evidence of learning specifications to define what it is their assessment should do. Um, I think back to the evidence-centered uh, design that Chris was talking about and how we can be very clear about what that evidence would look like. As I mentioned, I'm going to skip tool three for a moment and talk briefly about tool four. Um, it's one thing to plan for instruction and assessment. It's quite another to think about translating that plan into um, lesson design. And so tool four helps teachers do just that. They use an instructional model to uh, plan for learning sequences that were laid out in that unit plan um, from tool one. And it probably won't surprise many of you that the instructional model that we've selected to use is the BSCS 5 e instructional model. And tool three, as I mentioned, is uh, intended to help the participants, the users of these tools, uh, better understand the 5Es and how to use them to think about instruction. Um, tool 4 specifically offers opportunities for teachers to use their existing instructional materials in ways that help them uh, enact the next generation science standards in their classrooms. And finally, tool 5 um, helps teachers use the evidence of learning specifications uh, that they developed in tool 2 for a particular instructional sequence to develop an assessment task and um, determine then how students will demonstrate their understanding of uh, parts of or combinations of performance expectations that have been bundled for a particular instructional sequence. And we don't make, we do not claim that um, students would uh, actually achieve proficiency with a given performance expectation at the end of one performance expectation. Um, but we do think that, we do agree with the, uh, fully with the developers of the NGSS that uh, by the end of these grade bands and with these rich and powerful learning opportunities, um, students would be able to demonstrate what they are, know and are able to do through um, uh, large-scale assessments focused on the performance expectations. I want to talk just briefly about each one of the tools. So tool one begins with accessing teachers' prior knowledge. If we hope to make those conceptual shifts that we talked about at the beginning of the session, um, our best chance of doing that is starting where teachers are. And we do that by inviting them to think about what students should know and be able to do related to a particular um, uh, disciplinary core idea, and teachers write out what they think students should know and perhaps be able to do on post-it notes, and they represent those. There's a lot of conversation that goes into organizing those ideas um, uh, and then adding to those ideas the, a card deck 
that is developed from a standards page. And they get cards with the um, disciplinary core ideas uh, broken out so that each component idea and element is on a separate card. And then they receive a deck that includes the performance expectations from not only the disciplinary core ideas on that standards page, but other disciplinary core ideas that um, would be connection DCIs. They get a card deck that includes performance expectations. And then over the course of the, of the experience, they lay out cards for all of the dimensions. Um, an important component of this process is to think about the sequence of this particular unit of instruction and um, uh, the, the powerful conversations that teachers have in reaching consensus about what that looks like. Now, that's just a 30,000-foot description of the process that we use. The tool really is not much more than uh, boxes that get filled in, as represented by what you see here on the screen now, just these tiny little boxes that represent the conceptual flow of this particular unit of instruction and all the different components that would be in each individual instructional sequence. So for this particular blueprint, you'll see five instructional sequence. We've estimated that this would take seven to eight weeks of instruction. And um, teachers use the results of tool one then to inform their thinking about um, what, how can we use then performance expectations to think about classroom assessments. So they unpack those performance expectations by not only digging deeply into what is stated in the performance expectation, the clarification statement, and the assessment boundary, but also thinking about the disciplinary core ideas, the um, science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and other connections that are present to identify ideas that would be in the foreground and background for a particular instructional sequence. And they use those then to develop evidence of learning specifications. This is not the assessment task itself, but these are the specifications that would guide the development of that assessment task. Tool three, again, is to help teachers understand the 5E instructional model as a way to plan for instruction in a richer way. Um, again, teachers um, have a scaffolded learning experience around those uh, 5Es and then apply their learning in thinking about instructional, uh, thinking about using their instructional materials as they can to design learning sequences, or in some cases, they have to go out and seek additional resources um, or come up with additional learning experiences for students to uh, accomplish the goals for that particular learning sequence. And again, the tool is a series of boxes that get filled in. The important component is of these particular tools and processes or the processes. How are teachers scaffolded in thinking about and planning for instruction? And finally, um, using those evidence of learning specifications that were developed in tool two to actually develop assessment tasks. So again, a lot of work around um, with their colleagues and around the use of their instructional materials and those evidence of learning specifications to develop an assessment task. So with that, wow, that was fast. <laughs> but the idea is um, that as teachers use these, this suite of tools and processes to support the implementation of the next generation science standards, that they deepen their understanding of what's on a standards page and deepen their understanding of what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like to enact the NGSS and support student learning at the nexus of these three dimensions. So, so for the sake of time and because we're approaching 5 o'clock rather quickly, I think what we'll do is um, quickly go into our conclusion. And then we have a, a last question that asks about key takeaways. And I think if folks want to answer both questions, the one that's currently on the screen about using the NGSS tools and also general takeaways from the webinar, we can hit both of those at once. Um, if you're comfortable with that, Jody, we can just skate over this for now and go into the conclusions. Absolutely. So we've highlighted four key points that we hope um, permeate our conversation today. Absolutely. So. Um I'd like you to walk away from this. As we said, we had some questions at the start too, but 
I need to think about how the NGSS impacts teacher effectiveness and student learning in science education by focusing on learning at the nexus of the three dimensions. We've uh, mentioned a number of uh, places where that nexus is particularly important. Uh, we talked about how the NGSS highlights the, uh, the change in conceptual shifts in how we view science education. Um, through the STELLA program, we've talked about how professional development can help teachers deliver NGSS-aligned instruction and increase student achievement. And uh, finally, there you've heard about some tools uh, that emphasize deepening understanding of science and science instruction. So those are the kind of the key takeaway points for today. I think we have a question for you to ask about um, what you will take away from uh, this webinar. And Chris and Jody, as expected, folks are really interested in the tools that you shared, and you see a lot of comments over in the parking lot. Can you give them <laughs> any tidbits of information about when they will have access to maybe even draft forms of those tools? So that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned, they'll be ready for wide dissemination um, at the beginning of the summer. We feel like this is a complicated enough process um, that this requires us as leaders in science education to shift our own thinking. This is not business as usual. This is really tough. So we want to make sure that the tools and processes actually work <laughs> through a pilot and field test process, uh, through this iterative research and, and development revision and feedback um, to, de to deliver the best possible product. They will be widely available um, in the summer of 2015. And um, if you are uh, absolutely flaunting at the bit, uh, email us, and uh, we'll see what we can do. I know many of you are anxious because states have moved quite quick, quickly into adopting uh, the NGSS, but I think there's a general theme across everything, be it curriculum, assessment, professional development, these types of tools, to make sure we do things properly and to make sure we don't rush ahead and, send, and develop assessments too quickly without thinking deeply about what need to look like, that we don't just grab old curriculum and, and retrofit it to the next generation science standards without really thinking about what curriculum need to look like to fully um, address these standards. And the same with the professional development and the same with these types of tools. Probably not the answer everyone wanted to hear, <laughs> but <laughs> glad that at least they have a clear picture of what's happening and when they will potentially have access to the materials. And from our own work uh, across the country, we know that there are lots of great folks, great organizations who are developing tools and processes um, mm -hmm. that support this work as well. So um, I see you reaching out in the parking lot to one another and to your colleagues, and I would just encourage you to do that. Um, uh, bring together the best and the brightest and, and uh, work together collaboratively to figure out how to support teachers in these important efforts. So you'll see we already popped onto the screen the last two questions, key takeaways, and what action steps you plan to take. We're very interested in making this uh, not only a useful webinar for you in learning, but in actually adapting and changing your practice as a result of what you've learned. So we are always curious about what your plans are initially upon hearing um, this great information today. And we also believe that a lot of the sharing that goes on here will help others think about what they want to do when they head back to their respective schools and districts and states. And maybe while we're having folks respond to that, I have a few questions that we can touch on um, that people asked in the registration. Um, one that's particularly interesting, and I think, Chris, maybe you wanted to respond to this one, about how can parents really support the implementation of the NGSS? Oh, that's an interesting question, isn't it? I, liked, I was encouraged to see that one in, the, uh, um, in those questions during registration. Um, I think there are a number of ways, I and mean, one of them, of course, is to, is to read either the standards themselves or the framework. Um, they're surprisingly accessible. They're not um, written in education ease. Um, and there are also resources that are more accessible than those. So on the NSTA website, on the NGSS website, there are, there are videos, there are resources to help you get your heads around what these standards are about um, and help you um, communicate those and help you understand what the teachers will be talking to you about. Um, 
And then the second thing is I would uh, recommend that when you, you talk to your children about science, um, be that about what they're learning in school, taught in school, or topics around things that uh, come up in current events, um, to challenge uh, to challenge their thinking in ways um, that the NGSS do in, in, in terms of pushing student thinking. So instead of expecting them to know certain facts about science, as many parents probably learned science when they were young, um, to ask them how they know what they know, what evidence do they have to support their claims, um, ask them to make predictions about things around them, uh, to weigh the pros and cons of competing explanations, or even challenge where information is coming from and the types of influences those sources might have. Um, understanding science in the media is tremendously important. Um, question, as I say, questioning the sources of claims. So again, moving away from treating science as a body of facts, um, and rather a way of understanding and questioning the world. I love it. Um, as a parent of a preschooler, I will take away that advice. <laughs> So there's a lot of great takeaways here and action steps. I don't know in our last two minutes if you want to comment on any of those and um, offer any inspiring words of wisdom as folks carry on this mission out in the field. I guess the only thing that I might add is, is implied by the way that you've interacted today, and that is um, Chris and I are surrounded by amazing uh, science educators at BSCS. And we learn uh, from one another every day and just encourage you to take advantage of the, the folks around you to build your community um, because uh, we learn something new about the NGSS frequently. Um, even, even in the past uh, two weeks, uh, we've received some feedback from Achieve that we've really appreciated uh, to help us think about the work that we're doing. And uh, we continue to learn about what this work will look like. So thank you so much for being willing to engage with us today. Absolutely. Thank you all. OK. I know there's still some activity in the two pods, but we're going to need to pull those away so you can see the important contact information. I know folks are interested in that. So you should see coming up on your screen contact information for both Chris and Jody, as well as the BSCS website. And if you have general questions about our webinar series, you can reach out to me. You'll also know, I know several people have been asking, but again, the PowerPoint is a PDF version down in your resources box. And of course, you can find this slide there with the contact information. And we do have a forum for this series. And if you go to the website there, the relevantatlantic.org backslash forum, you can continue this conversation with colleagues uh, across the states and share resources. We also encourage you to come to our upcoming webinars. We have our Ask an Expert online chat series, which is a follow-up from last year's Cedar of Effectiveness series. We'll be addressing the Common Core State Standards and Teacher Effectiveness in our next session um, in about two weeks. And then our next Teacher Effectiveness webinar will be focusing on early childhood education. So we do hope that you'll find a way to attend each of those events, as well as our other upcoming events this fall. And finally, we're going to send you out to our survey. We really value your feedback. We feel that um, the input you can provide us will really help shape what we can offer in the future. And we want to be responsive to the needs of stakeholders, both in the Mid-Atlantic region and nationwide. And so we hope that you can provide us your honest feedback. And um, that's very useful to us. We appreciate everyone's attendance today, and we hope you've gained a lot out of the session. And at this time, I'd love to give a virtual round of applause to Chris and Jody for their excellent presentation this afternoon.
and thank you, everybody. Thank you all.